Hello everyone, reporting for First Updates Now, I'm Abbas, and with me here today is Team 14361 Robo Lobos. They're currently ranked first in their division, undefeated so far, with a couple of matches left. I'm sure they're going to try and keep that ranking all the way up there. They just have an absolutely amazing robot, and I cannot wait to dive into it on First Updates Now. This video on First Updates Now is made possible by viewers like you and also the following sponsors. Annie Mark has parts and products designed specifically for First Robox competition and First Tech Challenge teams. Many Annie Mark staff are first alumni, mentors, and event volunteers. Visit AnnieMark.com for all your educational robotics needs. Kettering University has over 25 pre-college camps and learning experiences available from computer science and engineering to inspiring future women engineers, leadership development, and first base camps for first graders to graduating high school seniors. Magna and GM sponsored camp fee scholarships are available. Email ctaylor at kettering.edu for more information. Okay guys, let's get started with your drivetrain. I think the first thing that sticks out to me is the polycarbonate side plates. So talk about that a little bit, why you went with that. You know, we know, we see the aluminum on the rest of the robots. So obviously you guys know how to use aluminum to build really fast robots. So why the polycarbonate? Yeah, so um, in-house we have our, uh, all this polycarb from our FRC team. So we're really comfortable using it and cutting it super fast. The main thing we didn't want to do with aluminum is our CNC isn't the greatest, it's not the most powerful. So we weren't really comfortable pocketing a ton uh, to have a lighter robot. So that was the main reason. Yeah, and so this is quarter inch polycarbonate then. And how has that held up for you guys throughout the season? We've had no problems with any breaking or bending. So yeah, just having it really ni nice and light worked out great. Yeah, and so in the future, would you recommend teams go for those polycarbonate side plates or do you think aluminum is still a better choice? Yeah, I think polycarb is a great option. It's just a little bit thicker, but it's really no problem at the end of the day. And it's held, up, it's, held up, it's held up great, so. Yeah, and you know, obviously one huge advantage with the polycarbonate is the transparency in the drive plates. Is that something that you guys have found to be like really, really advantageous for you or it's just like a nice feature that's there? Yeah, it absolutely helps. So especially like getting an inside look on the pulleys, seeing if anything's like melting or breaking inside, any screws that need to be tightened up, like add some access holes and it's really easy for fixing up. Yeah, and so now jumping in a little bit into the software and sensor use on this robot for your drivetrain and autonomous specifically, what sensors do you guys use? How do you use them? Walk me through all of it. Of course, so um, first we have four color sensors on the front of our robot. Uh, you can see the color sensor array. And so we use those in autonomous to read the tape line on the cone stack and readjust based off of that. That's been really consistent for us. We added that in between states and worlds and it's really helped our autonomous. Yeah, no, that, that's really interesting. And then as far as just driving around goes, are you guys using odometry, drive encoders, some other uh, system? How do you do that? Yeah, of course. So we use uh, three dead wheels on the bot. Um, yeah. <laughs> Again, so three dead wheels here. And then uh, they're just uh, less least strong. And then uh, those will work really well for us. Uh, we switched for two to uh, two dead wheels to an IMU for a little bit, but three has just worked really well. So we've consistent with that. And I think the other main thing is we drive field centric in teleop. So it's really easy to get around other robots. It might be a little bit slower, but we really like it just for the maneuverability. Yeah, that's fantastic. So now jumping into your lift, I think the number one thing we definitely have to talk about with you guys are those counter springing modules. So walk us through the development of them, how the idea came about and yeah, let's just jump right into it. Yeah, so when we were doing research for counter springing our modules, we saw a whole bunch of constant force springs, but then we just thought, we could probably uh, mechanically power the axles and we would get the same effect without having to have the room for the uh, springs on the slides. So we first tested this with a uh, actual, we took apart tape measures and just put the springs on there. It worked okay overall. And then we finally got through this final version after that. Yeah, I know that that's fantastic. And so, you know, was that a uh, system installed out of necessity? Like you guys needed more power for your lift or was it just sort of like a speed thing you guys really wanted to go as fast as possible on the way up? So kind of both. What was happening was about midway through the season, we were getting disconnects because we were drawing too much current. And we found that it was our, going through logs, we found our slides were drawing a lot of it. So we tried to get rid of that. And then a side effect of doing that with the counter springs, we got a speed of our slides like three times, I believe. Sure. And so now my next question about your slides is, uh, how are you powering them? Is it one or mo two, one, two, or, you know, even more motors? All right. So we have two motors, uh, both 1150 go build us. They are on their own individual axles, not mechanically linked. 
but we do have uh, our slides linked together so that we don't get off too much. Yeah, that's fantastic. So now jumping into your arm, you know, you guys are just whipping it around 24 seven on the field, super, super fast. So how does it work? How has it changed throughout the season? Just walk me through the whole thing. Yeah, so the big reason that we chose an arm like this was we drew inspiration from a lot of other teams from especially last year, like Delta Force had a similar angled arm. And what we really wanted to do, it, wanted to do with it was decrease the amount our slides have to travel. So it goes up on its own. We can like score lows without having to lift slides at all. And the geometry allows us to flip it backwards and pick up knocked over cones. And that's really useful, obviously, because of all the like skirmishes at the midline and, you know, accidents happen. Yeah, and so how are you guys powering your arms? Has it changed throughout the season or has it just been the same the entire time? Yeah, so these have gone, uh, the arm, we have the bearing mounts uh, to keep the splines healthy. And these have gone from go build a Torx, which were kind of slow and they broke on occasion. Then we went to Axon Minis and they were just way too fast. We didn't have like good control over them and those also broke. So we went to the Maxes and they've worked really great for us because the titanium gears are awesome and they just have a ton of power. Yeah, I know that's super interesting. And I think I see some counter springing also going on for this arm. Is that correct uh, in the back or was it just like not really needed? Uh, we don't have any counter springing on our arm. We just, that's just our cable management. I see. It hasn't been needed. At one point we did have it and then it broke and there was no effect on the arm speed. So we just figured we didn't need to replace it. Yeah, I know that's fantastic. And so now a little bit about the sensors. I see some color and distance sensors scattered around the arm, two on each side. So what do they do? How do they work? Walk me through it. Yeah, of course. So um, we have uh, two distance sensors on the arm. Uh, we'll turn the robot on so you can see those in action. Um, so there's two on the arm up here that determine the pole's tilt, these two right here. And when the pole is either angled differently or misaligned, we can adjust for that in, uh, in teleop. And that's really helpful for our drivers. And uh, we noticed that through testing with the liner upper that sometimes the pole can find its way behind it. And so to adjust for this, we added two distance sensors on the back of the bot. And when it gets stuck behind, you can see the arm will pull back and tilt and drop onto the pole. And that's been really helpful for our adjustment in teleop. Wow, yeah, that has to be one of the coolest demonstrations I think I've seen this season. Very, very impressive. And so now from a match perspective, how often do you guys use this? You know, at Houston, you guys have already played eight or nine matches. Has it been really helpful or have you guys just been uh, good at, more than good enough at driving that you haven't needed all of these adjustments? Yeah, so on occasion, like since it's like so fast, sometimes we were lined up and like snaps to something. And so on occasion, it does get in the way. Um, if that happens, I have a toggle. So like I can press that and then like they're there. Oh, like these ones are off. These ones will still activate. Um, but what happens is like I can just turn them off. And then if this gets behind, I turn them on for a quick second and it'll adjust. And then we just move on from there. Yeah, no, that is just absolutely fantastic. So now talking a little bit about your claw geometry, we've seen a lot of open source claws this year. This looks a little bit different than that. And I see a lot of different materials uh, throughout the assembly. So walk me through that if it's changed at all throughout the season and how it works now. So we actually started the season with the claw geometry was roughly similar to what it is now with the linkage drive. However, instead of these silicone grips, what we had was 3D printed nylon instead of polycarbonate. And we just had rubber band stretching. It worked really well. It would allow us to get the good grip. However, we then moved on to, um, we saw some other teams using silicone. So we we're like, we should test her out, out with this. We made some compliant ones that are a little less stiff than these are. They were working great. That's what we used at state, good grips. Um, the only problem was whenever we tried to grip up here or we got like a relatively bad grip, it wouldn't grip well. So then we made these a little thicker as well as adding extra support on it. So now we can grip the cone in any spot and get a really good grip. Okay, yeah, no, that's really interesting. And so uh, two questions about your claw. So first, these are cast, you guys cast them yourself. Yes. Okay, and you know, do you have any like resources for teams looking to do uh, casting and molding like you guys have done? So for casting, we haven't released any resources, but it was really relatively simple. We just, we basically catted the design we want, put it into a brick and then subtracted it out and then printed it and just molded. It wasn't too bad. Yeah, no, that's super interesting. And I see you guys have this rubber band on top. Uh, you know, does it have like some super functional purpose? And if so, what is it? Yeah, so we added that rubber band just because after we went away from the more compliant uh, material on the silicone, uh, this is like pretty stiff, so it pushes the cone away. And if we're lined up, how we line up in auto, if you want to set that up, how we line up in auto is everything flips backwards and the cone will go into the claw right here. It's going up and like and the rubber band just lets us keep the clock closed um, without having to power on the servos or anything and burn them out. 
Yeah, I know that makes a ton of sense. And I guess my last question is about your junction aligner. I see it has a lot of uh, compliancy in the design, just like a lot of the components on your robot. So how did you guys design that? How has it changed throughout the season? And walk me through that. Uh, all right. So originally we wanted to get away from having the liner upper because we didn't think there would be a really easy way to continue to be able to pick up knocked over cones from the back while having the liner upper. Then about after, I think it was after States. After before, right, before states. right before states we realized we could put a liner upper on it and all we had to do was add a in hinge onto it so we added a hinge so we could bend down however at states the problem was there was no stop on it so when we put the arm down sometimes we go too far and the the claw would touch the ground which was not great so when, then we added uh, this hard stop so that helps by stopping our arm whenever we're going down so we don't ever touch the ground as well as it makes sure that liner upper doesn't get out of the way and service yeah no robo lobos thank you so much this is just an absolutely incredible robot i will be really shocked if you guys don't get at least an award nomination you guys are just so so strong and have an amazing performance on and off the field thank you so much for this interview reporting for first updates now i'm abhas and this is team 14 361 robo lobos this video on First Updates Now is made possible by viewers like you and also the following sponsors. Kettering University has over 25 pre-college camps and learning experiences available from computer science and engineering to inspiring future women engineers, leadership development, and first-based camps for first graders to graduating high school seniors. Magna and GM sponsored camp fee scholarships are available. Email ctaylor at kettering.edu for more information. Animark is your one-stop shop for all your educational robotics needs. From mechanical, electrical, tools, and hardware, Animark has over 200 years of first-team experience and offers high-quality and affordable solutions for the robotics mobility and competition markets. Head on over to Animark.com to get started. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and ring the bell to stay up to date on our new videos. Keep the conversation going and provide your input to our content. Watch our live shows at twitch.tv forward slash first updates now. Join our Discord at discord.gg forward slash first updates now and check out Fun FTC on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, and First Updates Now on Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, and Twitter.